Chapter Four, Part Two of Commentary on the Gospel of John, Book Two, by Cyril of Alexandria, translated by Reverend Philip Edward Pusey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Four, five, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sichar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. O oh, great readiness of mind and deep prudence! He prevents by his answers the things that would have been asked of him. For some one would straightway have said, either speaking to another or secretly reasoning, Why did our Lord Jesus Christ, in not fit season, give illumination to the Samaritans? For once there came to him the Syrophoenician woman, with tears entreating mercy for her wretched daughter, and what said the compassionate to her? It is not meet, saith he, to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. For he did not think it right, I suppose, to pour forth upon the Gentiles before the time the grace assigned to them of Israel. And this himself made clearer by saying, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. How then, will one say, did he who was sent to Israel alone begin to instruct the race of the Samaritans, albeit Israel had not yet wholly spurned the grace? To such things does he introduce the reply persuasive with power, to wit, that he must needs go through Samaria. For not for this reason alone did he arrange his sojourn with the Samaritans, that he might preach the word among them, and wholly transfer the whole blessing from Israel. But since he must needs pass through, therefore doth he teach, fulfilling the work of wisdom. For as fire will never cease from its inherent natural operation of burning, so I deem it wholly impossible that the wisdom of all should not work what befits wisdom and as, while saying that it is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it unto dogs, yet to the woman who wept and entreated for pity with many words, he cast the grace, not admonished by another of the season for giving it, but himself with the Father being a pointer of it, as Son and God and Lord. So did he pity the Samaritans too, and unveiling the ineffable might of his God-befitting authority, he made the illumination of a whole country the bywork of a journey. It were besides strange that Israel, who was already mad in folly, and imagining slaughter against the Lord, should be perfectly loved. But since they do not yet thoroughly persecute him, but as yet only in measure, therefore our Lord Jesus the Christ, also doth not yet wholly strip them of his grace, but doth nevertheless draw off the blessing by little and little to others. But his departing wholly from the country of the Jews, and hasting to go into that of aliens, by reason of the cruelty of his persecutors, was a threat, depicted on the nature of the thing as in a type, that they should endure the total loss of grace, and should dismiss unto others their own good, that is, the Christ, unless they abstain from their violence against him. 6. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. Having crossed the borders of Judea, and being now among aliens, the Saviour rests upon Jacob's well, showing us again as in a type and darkly, that even though the preaching of the gospel should depart from Jerusalem, and the divine word at length hasten forth to the Gentiles, there shall not be lost therewith to Israel the love to their fathers, but Christ shall cleave to them again, and shall again be refreshed and rest, as in his saints, preserving to them the pristine unfading grace for he loveth to dwell in the memories of his saints, that he may make himself an example to us in this also, and may become the beginning and door of the honour given to the fathers. But being wearied with his journey, as it is written, he resteth, that in this too he may accuse the impiety of those that drove him away. 
for whereas they ought to have gained his friendship by kindly honours cherishing him with reverence and fear as a benefactor they maltreat the lord with toil and labours that he may be true saying of them in the book of psalms and they rewarded me evil for good herein then is seen the daring of the jews but what will the arians again neighbours of these in folly answer us to this yea rather to whom it would rightly be said sodom was justified by thee for the one crucify christ in the flesh but the others rage against the ineffable nature itself of the word lo he was wearied with his journey who was he who suffered this will ye bring before us the lord of hosts lacking in might and will ye lay upon the only begotten of the father the toil of the journey that he may be conceived of as even passable who cannot suffer or will ye acting rightly refuse so to think and attribute the charge of these to the nature of the body only yea rather will ye say that the toil befits the human nature rather than him who is and is conceived of as bare word by himself as then he who possesses in his own nature power over all things and is himself the strength of all is said to be wearied for do not i pray do not divide the one christ into a duality of sons even though he make his own the sufferings of his human nature albeit he abideth impassable since he became man who had it not in him to be weary so if he at all speak also of things which we think rather befit man and not god let us not hunt after words nor when we most need skill unto piety be then caught in exceeding folly putting the plan of the economy of the flesh far away from us ascending hotly to the very godhead of the word and laying hold with much folly of the things above us for if he were not altogether called man if he were not made in the form of a servant it were right to be troubled when one said anything servile of him and to demand rather all things according to what befits god but if in firm faith and unswervingly we are confident that according to the voice of john the word was made flesh and tabernacled among us when thou seest him speaking as flesh that is as man receive discourse befitting man for confirmation of the preaching for in no other way could we know certainly that he being god and word became man had not the impassable been recorded to have suffered something and the high one to have uttered something lowly it was about the sixth hour he shows that opportunely did jesus rest upon the well for the sun pouring down its strongest rays from the mid vault on those upon the earth and consuming bodies with its unmitigated strokes it would not have been without her to have gone further but was more convenient to rest a little especially when he would easily have thrust away the charge of luxuriousness if the fitness of the season had agreed thereto he does not say that it was the sixth hour precisely but about the sixth hour that we too may learn not to be indifferent even about the least things but rather to try and practice truth in common things seven eight nine there cometh a woman of samaria to draw water jesus saith unto her give me to drink for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat then saith the woman of samaria unto him the saviour was not ignorant of the woman's coming for right well did he know being very god that she would forthwith be there to draw the cold stream from the fountain but when she was now come he began to get his prey within the toils and straightway holding forth the word of teaching he made his discourse from what was before him the law appointed for the jews that they must not be defiled in any way and therefore ordered them to withdraw from every unclean thing and not to mix themselves up with strangers or uncircumcised 
but they carrying forward the force of the commandment to something more and following most empty observances rather than the exactness of the law nor venturing so much as to touch the flesh of any alien used to think that they would incur all uncleanness if they were found having to do with the samaritans in anything to so great an extent did their disagreement at length advance that they recoiled from tasting water or food brought to them by the hand of aliens in order then that the woman may exclaim and that his unwonted conduct may invite her to ask who he is and whence and how he despises the jewish customs and so at length the conversation may come to his aim he makes as though thirsty saying give me to drink but she said ten how is it that thou being a jew askest drink of me which am a woman of samaria for the jews have no dealings with the samaritans jesus answered and said unto her inquiry is the beginning of learning and to those who are ignorant upon any subject doubt concerning it is the root of understanding this commencement the discourse aims at wherefore the saviour wisely hints that he accounts of no value the customs of the jews eleven if thou knewest the gift of god and who it is that saith to thee give me to drink thou wouldest have asked of him and he would have given thee living water the woman saith unto him not knowing the essence of the only begotten surpassing earth and heaven yea rather being wholly ignorant of the incarnate word the woman was calling him a jew and profitably is he silent to this that the foundation of his discourse with her may be kept yet he does uplift her to a higher conception of himself saying that she knows not who it is who asked drink or how great grace divine gifts have insomuch that if she had had knowledge of it she would not have endured to be behindhand for she would have prevented the lord in asking he rouses her then by these things to a very earnest wish to learn observe how now too fashioning his discourse skilfully and free from boast he says that he is god even though the woman be slow to understand for inducing her to marvel at the gift of god he introduces himself as the giver of it for if says he thou knewest the gift of god and who it is that saith to thee thou wouldest have asked of him but whom would it be fit to give the things of god would it not him who is by nature god but he calls the quickening gift of the spirit living water whereby alone human nature albeit well nigh parched to its very roots rendered now dry and barren of all virtue by the villainies of the devil runneth back to its pristine beauty of nature and drinking in the life-giving grace is adorned with varied forms of good things and shooting forth into a virtuous habit puts forth most thriving shoots of love towards god some such thing as this god says to us by the prophet isaiah also the beast of the field shall honour me the dragons and the owls because i give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people my chosen whom i have formed for myself to declare mine excellencies and another of the saints says that the soul of the righteous shall be as a fruitful tree and shall spring up as grass among the waters and shall appear as the willow by running water we might heap up besides those already quoted many other testimonies also from the divine scripture whence it would be very easy to show that under the name of water the divine spirit is often named but it is no time to linger here wherefore we will swim to other places pressing on upon the great and wide sea of divine meditations sir thou hast nothing to draw with and the well is deep from whence then hast thou that living water the woman imagines nothing more than what she is accustomed to and by no means understands the force of what is said but supposes 
that like some of those who are accustomed to work wonders by means of charms and devilish deceit without a line or other contrivance he will draw up the water to her from the depths of the well but she calls that living water according to her own meaning which has fresh flowed from the breast of the fountain twelve thirteen art thou greater than our father jacob which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle jesus answered and said unto her the woman arrests herself in that as quickly as possible being conscious that she had taken up ideas of him neither holily nor surely true for it was not possible that she should not be altogether profited to understanding who is wholly enjoying the divine words since then it was possible that he who speaks should not be a magician but rather a prophet and one of those surpassing in holiness and had therefore promised to give her the living water without the usual means of buckets or having found water far better to use from another source she straightway changes her discourse for the soberer and as it were compares saint with saint saying art thou greater than our father jacob who gave us this well receive the intelligence of her thought from her no longer wondering at his promising water without a rope but speaking only of its quality to the taste the samaritans then were aliens for they were colonists of the babylonians but they called jacob their father for two reasons for as inhabiting a country bordering on and the neighbour of the jews land they were taking a little impression themselves of their worship and were accustomed to boast of the jews ancestors besides it was really true that the greater number of the inhabitants of samaria were sprung from the root of jacob for jeroboam the son of nebat having gathered together ten tribes of israel and the half tribe of ephraim departed from jerusalem in the time of the kingdom of rehoboam the son of solomon and took samaria and built houses therein and cities fourteen fifteen whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again but whosoever drinketh of the water that i shall give him shall never thirst but the water that i shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life the woman saith unto him the woman of samaria proposing is a hard question and difficult to cope with art thou greater than our father jacob the saviour most skilfully avoids all boasting not saying clearly that he is greater yet from the nature of the actions does he persuade her to approve him who excels therefore he shows that incomparable is the difference between the spiritual waters and the sensible and grosser ones saying whosoever shall drink of this water shall thirst again but he that is filled saith he with my water shall not only be shown to be superior to thirst henceforth but he shall have in him a well of water able to nourish him to eternal life therefore he that giveth the greater is greater saith he than he that hath the less and the worsted will not carry off the same glory as the conqueror we must know again that the saviour here calls the grace of the holy ghost water whereof if any be partaker he shall have the gift of the divine teaching evermore flowing up within him so as no more to be in need of admonition from others yea rather readily to suffice to exhort those who thirst after the divine and heavenly word such as were some yet living in this present life and upon earth the holy prophets and apostles and the heirs of their ministrations of whom it was written and ye shall draw water with joy out of the wells of salvation sixteen give me this water that i thirst not neither come hither to draw jesus saith unto her again does she both speak and imagine only ordinary things and of the things that were said understands no whit but she supposes that in being released from petty toils 
will consist all the aim of our Saviour, and to thirsting no more does she bound the measure of the grace of God, not so much as in bare idea receiving things above the world. Go call thy husband, and come hither. Well, and not untruly, might one say, that the minds of woman are womanish, and that an effeminate soul is in them, never having the power of understanding readily. But the nature of man somehow is apter for learning, and far more ready for reasoning, having a mind awake to wisdom, and, so to say, warm, and of matured manhood. For this reason, I suppose, did he bid the woman call her husband, secretly convicting her as having a heart most low to learn, not practised in the words of wisdom. Yet he is at the same time contriving something else most beautiful. 17, 18, 19. The woman saith to him, I have no husband. Jesus saith unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, To whom is it not now evident that the Saviour was not ignorant that she was bereft of any rightful husband, and that he made the inquiry about her husband who was not a plea for making known hidden things. For he was, he was thus with difficulty able to help her no longer marvelling at him as one of us, but as now above man, by reason of his wondrous knowledge of her circumstances. And profitably does he approve her saying she has no husband, although she had had so many, for not the coming together out of pleasure, but the approval of the law and bond of pure love make marriage blameless. Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. With difficulty does she brighten up to apprehension, and that again not yet perfect. For she still calls the Lord of prophets a prophet but she has by degrees shown herself better than before in no way ashamed at reproof seizing to her own profit the force of the sign and so going forth from her effeminate understanding attaining to some extent to a vigorous mind and stretching forth the eye of her heart to an unwonted view of things wherein we must chiefly admire alike the forbearance and power of our saviour who easily remodels our untutored understanding to an admirable condition. 2021. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Conceiving that the Lord is in truth a prophet and a Jew, she boasts exceedingly of the customs of her country, and asserts that the Samaritans are far superior in wisdom to the Jews. For the Jews, admitting two gross notions of the divine and incorporeal nature, contended that in Jerusalem alone, or its neighbor Sion, ought the God over all to be worshipped as though the whole ineffable and incomprehensible nature had once for all there taken abode, and was enclosed in temples made with hands. Wherefore they were convicted of being utterly without understanding by the voice of the prophets, God saying, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? The Samaritans, again little remote from the folly of the jews bordering both in country alike and uninstructedness supposing that in the mound called gerizim they ought both to pray and worship rightly escape not being laughed at but the plea to them also of their senselessness was that the blessing was given in mount gerizim as we find written in deuteronomy this question the woman proposes to the Saviour as some great and difficult problem, saying, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and so on. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming, when neither in Jerusalem nor in this mountain shall ye worship the Father. He condemns alike the folly of all, saying that the mode of worship of both shall be transformed to the more truthful. 
for no longer saith he shall a place be sought wherein they shall deem that god properly dwells but as filling and able to contain all things shall they worship the lord every one from his place as one of the holy prophets says he says that his own sojourn in the world with a body is the time and season for a change of such customs observe how with most gentle leading of discourse does he guide the mind of the woman to right conceptions respecting the son by calling god the father for how shall the father at all be conceived of if the son be not end of chapter four chapter five part one of commentary on the gospel of john book two by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five that the son is not in the number of worshippers in that he is word and god but rather is worshipped with the father twenty two ye worship ye know not what we know what we worship for salvation is of the jews he speaks again as a jew and a man since the economy of the matter in hand demands now too this mode of speaking for christ would not have missed meet opportunity yet does he attribute something more in respect of understanding to the worship of the jews for the samaritans worship god simply and without search but the jews having received through the law and prophets the knowledge of him who is as far as they were able therefore he says that the samaritans know not but that the jews have good knowledge of whom he affirms that salvation shall be revealed that is himself for christ was of the seed of david according to the flesh david of the tribe of judah amongst the worshippers again as man does he class himself who together with god the father is worshipped both by us and the holy angels for since he had put on the garb of a servant he fulfilleth the ministry befitting a servant having not lost the being god and lord and to be worshipped for he abideth the same even though he hath become man retaining throughout the plan of the dispensation after the flesh and even though thou see an abasement great and supernatural approach wondering not accusing not fault-finding but rather imitating for such paul desireth to see us saying let this mind be in each of you which was also in christ jesus who being in the form of god thought it not robbery to be equal with god but emptied himself taking upon him the form of a servant made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself seest thou how the son became to us a pattern of lowliness being in equality and form of the father as it is written yet descended for our sakes to a voluntary obedience and lowliness how then could the garb of obedience how could that of lowliness appear otherwise than through deeds and words beneath his god-befitting dignity and having a great inferiority to those wherein he was while yet bare word with the father and not involved in the form of a servant how shall we say that he has at all descended if we allow him nothing unworthy of him how was he made in the likeness of men according to the voice of paul if he imitated not what befits man but a thing most befitting man is worship regarded in the light of a debt and offered by us to god therefore he worshippeth as man when he became man he is worshipped ever with the father since he was and is and will be god by nature and very but our opponent will not endure this but will withstand us saying think it not strange when we say that the son worships for we do not suppose that the son ought to worship the father in the same way as we or the angels for example 
but the worship of the sun is something special and far better than ours what then shall we reply to these things thou thinkest fellow to mislead us by putting a most noble bondage about the only begotten and gilding over the dignity of a servant by certain words of deceit cease from glorifying the son with dishonour that thou mayest continue to honour the father for he that honoureth not the son neither doth he honour the father as it is written for what tell me will it profit the only begotten in respect of freedom that his worship of the father should be made more excellent than ours for so long as he is found among worshippers he will be altogether a bondman and even though he be conceived of as a superior worshipper yet will he by no means differ from creatures in respect of being originate but only in the remaining excellencies as to men is superior michael or any other of the holy and reasonable powers to whom superiority to those upon earth seems essentially to belong either in respect of holiness or any superabundance of glory it having been so decreed by the chief artificer of all things god but the being classed with things originate as having been created is common to them with the rest the word then who is in the father and of the father by nature will never escape being originate even though he be said to worship in a more excellent way then how will that which is made be yet son or how will the bondman and worshipper be by nature lord for i suppose that the royal and lordly dignity is pre-eminent in being worshipped but the office of servant and slave is defined in his paying worship we confess then by being subject that we hold ourselves bound to worship the nature which is superior and above all wherefore it was proclaimed to the whole creation by the all-wise moses thou shalt worship the lord thy god and him only shalt thou serve so that to whatsoever servitude belongs by nature and whatever boweth under the yoke of the godhead this full surely must needs worship and submit to the garb of adoration for in saying lord he defines the bond in saying god the creature for together are they conceived of and contrasted the bond with him who is by nature lord in that which is brought into being with the inoriginate godhead but seeing the son is eternally in the father and is lord as god i am at a loss to show whence he can appear to owe worship but let them proceed with their babbling the only begotten says he will worship the father neither is bond nor created but as a son the father we must therefore take adoration into the definition of sonship and say that it altogether behoves the son to worship the father for that in this consists his being even as does ours in being reasonable mortal creatures recipient of mind and knowledge rather than in committing ourselves to motions external and impulsive and to the mere swayings of will for if there have been implanted by nature into the only begotten the duty holy and of necessity to worship and they so hold and say how will they not be caught in naked blasphemy against the father himself for it is altogether necessary to conceive of him too as such since the son is his image and impress and whatever things are in exact likeness these full surely will differ in nothing but if they say that the son pays worship to the father in will alone they are guessers rather than knowers of the truth for what would hinder others too from saying fabricating a hazardous piety that it was the will of the father to worship the son though not a worshipper by nature but says he fitness itself will remove the person of the father will subject the son to this his worship of the father not unwilled what sayest thou o sir dost thou again bring forth to us oracles as from shrines or greek tripods or comest thou like that shamaiah the nehelamite 
belching forth out of thine own heart and not out of the mouth of the lord and dost thou not blush opposing to us fitness as though invincible in these matters for dost thou not think it befits him who is by nature god to have the word begotten of him god and that he whom the whole creation worships should be called and be by nature the father of a son who is worshipped rather than a worshipper but i think i say nothing displeasing to the truly wise but how shall we define that it also befits that the father be worshipped by his own offspring when such a conception as to both endures so great damage for in the first place that which worships not will be neither in equality of dignity nor in exact image of nature with that which worships for it worships as inferior and that not measurable by quantity in respect of any natural quality for he that is god or lord will not be lesser but is differing in the definition of mode of being then how will he be shown to be true in saying he that hath seen me hath seen the father how doth he say that he ought to be honoured in no less degree than the father if he be not his equal in glory by reason of his worshipping then besides the father will himself too appear to be in no slight unseemliness for it is his glory to beget such as himself is by nature on the other hand it is no slight disgrace to have a son of another kind and alien and to be in such case as even the very nature of things originate shrinks from for they that have received power to bear bear not worse than themselves by the ordinance and will of the artificer of all things for saith he let the earth bring forth grass the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind and after his likeness the godhead then will be in worse case than things originate since they are thus it not so but that which was adjudged alike to be fit and to have been well arranged for the successions of things which are this it alone will be found without who then most excellent sirs will endure you saying that it befits the son to worship his father but when it has been added to those words of yours that neither is this unwilled by the only begotten and this gratuitous argument of yours ye fortify merely by fitness come let us consider this too from the divine scriptures whence i think one ought zealously to look for proof on every disputed point the law therefore enjoined the half of a didram to be paid by every one of the jews to him who is god over all not as devising a way of getting wealth nor contributions of money to no purpose but imparting us instruction by clearest types first that no one is lord of his own head but that we all have one lord enrolled under servitude by the deposit of tribute next depicting the mental and spiritual fruits as in a grosser representation and act for says he honour the lord with thy righteous labours and render him the first fruits of thy fruits of righteousness which came to pass through the gospel teaching the worship after the law being at last closed for no longer do we think we ought to worship with external offerings the lord of all pressing to pay the didram of corruptible matter but being true worshippers we worship god the father in spirit and in truth this meaning we must suppose to lie hid in the letter of the law when then the lord was in jerusalem the gatherers of the didram were asking of peter saying doth not your master pay the didram but when he was come into the house as it is written jesus prevented him saying of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute of their own children or of strangers when he said of strangers jesus said then are the children free yet lest we should offend them go thou to the sea and cast an hook and take up the fish that first cometh up and when thou hast opened his mouth 
thou shalt find a stater that take and give unto them for me and thee seest thou that the son endured not to be under tribute and as one of those under the yoke of bondage to undergo a servile thing for knowing the free dignity of his own nature he affirms that he owes nothing servile to god the father for he says the children are free how then hath he the worship befitting a slave in that of his own will he who shrank at even the bare type of the thing how could he accept the verity for shall we not reckon worship as a tribute and spiritual fruit-bearing and say that it is a kind of service for why did the law join service to worship saying thou shalt worship the lord thy god and him only shalt thou serve for worship is so to say the gate and way to service indeed being the beginning of servitude to god wherefore the psalmist says to some o come let us worship and fall down and weep before the lord our maker seest thou how the duty of falling down follows upon and is joined to worshipping than which what will be more befitting a servant at least in the estimation of those who rightly weigh the qualities of things i cannot say but if our opponents persist bearing themselves haughtily and yet unbroken impudence and cease not from their uninstructed reasonings on these subjects let them going through the whole holy scripture show us the son worshipping god the father while he was yet bare word before the times of the incarnation and the garb of servitude for now is man he worships unblamed but then not yet so but they will not be able to show this from the divine and sacred scriptures but heaping up conjectures and surmisings of corrupt imaginations will with reason hear ye do err not knowing the scriptures nor the glory of the only begotten for that he does not worship in that he is word and god but having become as we he undertook to endure this too as befits man by reason of the dispensation of the flesh the proof shall not be sought by us from without but we shall know it from his own words for what is it that he is saying to the woman of samaria ye worship ye know not what we know what we worship is it not hence too clear to everybody that in using the plural number and numbering himself with those who worship of necessity and as bond that it is as made in human nature which is bond that he is saying this for what tell me would hinder his drawing the worship apart into his own person if he wished to be conceived of by us as a worshipper for he should rather have said i know what i worship in order that unclassed with the rest he might appropriate the force of the utterance to himself alone but now most excellently and with all security he says we as already ranked among the bond by reason of his manhood as numbered among the worshippers as a jew by country twenty three twenty four twenty five but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the father in spirit and truth for the father seeketh such to worship him god is a spirit and they that worship him must worship in spirit and truth the woman saith to him he is intimating the time now present of his own presence and says that the type shall be transferred to truth and the shadow of the law to spiritual worship he tells that through the gospel teaching the true worshipper that is the spiritual man shall be conducted to a polity well pleasing unto the father hasting unto ownness with god for god is conceived of as a spirit in reference to the embodied nature rightly therefore does he accept the spiritual worshipper 
who does not in form and type carry in jewish wise the form of godliness but in gospel manner resplendent in the achievements of virtue and in rightness of the divine doctrines fulfilleth the really true worship we know that messias is coming which is called christ when he is come he will tell us all things upon christ's teaching that the hour and season will come rather is already present wherein the true worshippers shall offer to god the father the worship in spirit forthwith the woman is winged to thoughts above her want unto the hope spoken of by the jews she confesses that she knows that the messiah will come in his own time and to whom he will come she does not exactly say receiving as is like the common reports of him without any investigation as being a laughter-loving and carnal-minded woman yet is she not wholly ignorant that he will be manifested to israel as a bringer in of better teaching finding most certainly this information too in the reports about him twenty six jesus saith unto her i that speak unto thee am he not to untutored or wholly ignorant souls doth christ reveal himself but shines upon and appears the rather to those who are more ready to desire to learn and travailing with the beginning of the faith in simple words press forward to the knowledge of what is more perfect such an one as this was the woman of samaria also shown to us giving her mind more grossly than she ought to the truly divine ideas but not entirely removed from the desire of understanding somewhat for first on christ asking for drink she does not readily give it but beholding him breaking as far as one can speak humanly the national customs of the jews she begins to seek first the reason of this all but by her mentioning it inviting the lord to an explanation how is it says she that thou being a jew askest drink of me which am a woman of samaria but when during the progress of questioning she at length begun to confess that he was a prophet having received his reproof a medicine unto salvation she added another inquiry saying with zeal for learning our fathers worshipped in this mountain and ye say that in jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship but he was teaching this again that the time shall come yea is already present when the true worshippers rejecting worship on the mountains of earth shall offer the higher and spiritual worship to god the father she attributing the best of all as the due of the christ alone and keeping the more perfect knowledge for those times says we know that messiah cometh which is called christ when he is come he will tell us all things seest thou how ready to believe the woman was already getting as though ascending a staircase springs up from little questions to a higher condition it was right then to lay open to her with now clearer voice what she longed for telling her that that which was preserved in good hope is at length set before her in sight i that speak unto thee am he let them therefore who have the care of teaching in the churches commit to the new-born disciples the word of teaching to be digested and so at length let them show them jesus bringing them up from slight instruction to the more perfect knowledge of the faith but let them who taking hold of the alien and so proselyte and bringing him within the inner veil suffer him to offer the lamb with hands yet unwashen and crown with the dignity of the priesthood him who is not yet instructed prepare for a mighty account in the day of judgment it is sufficient for me only to say this twenty seven and upon this came his disciples the presence of the disciples is the conclusion of his conversation with the woman for the saviour is at length silent and having placed in the samaritans the glowing spark of the faith commits it to their inward parts to be kindled to a mighty flame 
thus you may understand what was said by him i am come to send fire on the earth and what will i if it be already kindled and marvelled that he talked with the woman the disciples again are astonished at the gentleness of the saviour and wonder at his meek way for not after the manner of some who are fierce with unslacked religion did he think right to shun conversation with the woman but unfolds his loving-kindness to all and hereby shows that he being wholly one artificer doth not to men alone impart the life through faith but snareth the female race also thereto let him that teacheth in the church gain this too as a pattern and not refuse to help women for one must in everything follow not one's own will but the service of preaching yet no man said what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her it was the work of wise disciples and knowing how to preserve their master's honour not to seem by their superfluous questions to be going off into strange surmises because he was talking with a woman but rather in reverence and fear to restrain their tongue within their teeth and to await their lord speaking of his own accord in giving them a voluntary explanation we must therefore herein marvel at christ for his gentleness at the disciples for their wisdom and understanding and knowledge of what is becoming twenty eight the woman therefore left her water-pot and went her way into the city the woman now shows herself superior to and above the cares of the body who two or three days ago was the wife of many and she who oft-times was easily taken captive by vain pleasures now overreaches the flesh of its necessary want disregarding alike thirst and drink and is re-wrought unto another habit through faith forthwith doth she exercising love the fairest of all virtues and neighbourly affection diligently proclaiming to others also the good which appeared to her hasten quickly into the city for probably the saviour was telling her and secretly whispering in her mind freely ye received freely give learn we hereby not to imitate that sloth-loving servant and who therefore hid his talent in the earth but rather let us be diligent to trade with it which thing too that much talked of woman well doing communicates to the rest the good which fell to her no longer taking the water which she came to draw from its fountain depths nor carrying home her water-pot of the earth but rather with divine and heavenly grace in the all-wise teaching of the saviour filling the garners of her understanding we must hence learn as any type and outline that by thoroughly despising little and corporal things we shall receive of god things manifold more and better for what is earthly water compared with heavenly wisdom twenty nine and saith to the men come see a man which told me all things that ever i did is not this the christ o wondrous change o truly great and god befitting might translucent with unspeakable marvel skilful workwoman unto doctrine and initiator is she who understood none of the things that were said at first and therefore rightly heard go call thy husband and come hither for see how skilfully she conversed with the samaritans she does not see at once that she has found the christ nor does she introduce jesus at first into her account for rightly would she have been rejected as far surpassing the measure of words befitting her finding her hearers not ignorant of her habits she first then prepares the way for this wonder and having first astonished them with the miracle makes the way smoother so to say to the faith come and see she wisely says all but crying aloud with more earnest voice sight alone will suffice to believe and will assure those present with its more noteworthy marvels 
for he who knoweth the hidden things and hath this great and god-befitting dignity how shall he not speed with prosperous course to the fulfilment of those things which he willeth thirty they went out of the city and came unto him the obedience of the samaritans is a conviction of the hardness of heart of the jews and their inhumanity is clearly shown in the gentleness of these and let the seeker of learning see again the difference of habit in both that he may justly wonder at jesus departing from the synagogue of the jews and giving himself rather to the aliens for that christ should come to the jews and for what causes he should be revealed the law of moses declared to us the all august choir of the prophets did proclaim and did point him out at length all but present at the doors saying behold your god behold the lord and last of all john the great among them that are born of women did manifest him already appeared and dwelling among us saying behold the lamb of god which taketh away the sin of the world and yet more wonderfully than all the saviour was revealing himself through many deeds of power and god befitting authority what then do these men unbridled unto strange counsels at last meditate yet they devise murder unjustly they plot impiously they envy stubbornly they drive forth of their land and city the life the light the salvation of all the way to the kingdom the remission of sins the bestower of sonship wherefore rightly said the saviour o jerusalem jerusalem thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee how often would i have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathereth her chickens unto her wings and ye would not behold your house is left unto you but the samaritans showed themselves superior to the folly of the jews and by obedience victorious over their innate unlearning having given ear to one miracle only they flock quickly to jesus not persuaded thereto by the voices of the holy prophets nor by the proclamations of moses nor yet the actual pointings of john but one only woman and she is sinner telling them of him with reason then let us too admiring the sentence of the saviour against them say righteous art thou o lord and upright thy judgment end of chapter five part one chapter five part two of commentary on the gospel of john book two by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey this librivox recording is in the public domain thirty one thirty two in the meantime his disciples prayed him saying master eat but he saith unto them most excellently doth the divine evangelist manage the compilation of this book and omits nothing which he believes will at all be of use to the readers hear therefore how he introduces jesus again as the ensample of a most noteworthy act for i do not think that anything has been put in vain in the writings of the saints but what any man deems small he sometimes finds pregnant with no contemptible profit the conversion of the samaritans being then begun and they on the point of looking for him for he knew as god that they would come wholly and entirely is he intent upon the salvation of them which are called and makes no account of bodily food although wearied with his journey as it is written that hereby again he might profit the teachers in the churches and persuade them to disregard all fatigue and use more diligent zeal for those who are being saved than for the care of their bodies for cursed saith the prophet be he that doeth the work of the lord negligently 
in order then that we may learn that the lord was accustomed to go without food at such times he introduces the disciples begging and all but on their knees that he would take a little of their provisions as inevitable and necessary food for they had gone away into the city to buy meat which they had now got and come with i have meat to eat that ye know not of skilfully does the saviour fashion his answer from what was before him he all but says darkly that if they knew that the conversion of the samaritans was at the doors they would have persuaded him rather to cling to that as a delicacy than to nourish the flesh from this again we may learn how great love for man the divine nature hath for it considereth the return of the lost unto salvation as both meat and treat thirty three thirty four therefore said the disciples one to another hath any man brought him aught to eat jesus saith unto them the disciples not yet understanding the discourse which was obscure were reasoning about what had often happened among themselves and descend to commonplace ideas fancying that food had been brought him by some one and that it was perhaps more costly or sweeter than what had been got together by them my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to complete his work having wholly torn away the veil from his speech he showed them in full translucence the truth and forthwith introduces himself as a type unto future teachers of the world of steadfast and most exceeding excellent zeal to wit in respect of the duty of teaching and on this account fitly keeping thought for the needful care of the body secondary for in saying that it was to himself most pleasant meat to do the will of him that sent him and to finish his work he limbs the office of the apostolic ministry and clearly shows what manner of men they ought to be in habit for it was necessary as it seems that they should be strung to taking thought for teaching only and it behoved them to be so far removed from the pleasure of the body as at times not even to desire the service necessary for the mere accomplishing its preservation from death and let this be said for the present as tending to the type and pattern of apostolic polity but if we must in addition to what has been said apply ourselves to speak more doctrinally he says that he was sent clearly by god the father either in respect of the incarnation wherein he beamed on the world with flesh by the good pleasure and approbation of the father or as the word proceeding in some way from the begetting mind and sent in fulfilling his decree not as though taken as a minister of others wills but himself being alike both the living word and the most evident will of the father readily saving those that were lost therefore in saying that it is the work of him that sent him himself is shown as its fulfiller for all things are by the father through the son in the spirit for that the son is the word and counsel and will and power of the father is i suppose evident to all but it is no trouble to prove it from the divine scripture also therefore let any one see that he is the word in this in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god let him see counsel in that the psalmist says as to god the father in thy counsel thou guidest me and with glory didst thou receive me let him see will again in his saying lord in thy will give strength to my beauty for he strengthened the beauty of his saints that is their vigour unto every virtue he the living and hypostatic will of the father that is the son that he is power also thou shalt again understand hence command o god he says thy strength strengthen o god that which thou wroughtest for us thou seest clearly herein that by the good pleasure of god the father his power that is the son was incarnate 
that he might strengthen this body which he perfected for us for if he had not tabernacled among us neither would the nature of the flesh at all have put off the infirmity of corruption the son then being himself the good will of the father perfects his work being shown forth salvation to them that believe on him but some one will say to this if the son is himself the will of the father what will was he sent to fulfil for the fulfilled must needs be other than the fulfiller what therefore do we say to this the giving of names indeed demands difference in the thing signified but often there is no difference in respect of god and word regarding the supreme nature rejects accuracy herein for its properties are spoken of not altogether as they are in truth but as tongue can express and ear of man hear for he that seeth darkly darkly also he speaketh for what wilt thou do when he who is by nature simple introduceth himself to us as compound in that he saith of them of israel and their children they made pass through the fire which i commanded not neither came it into my heart for must not the heart needs be other than he in whom it is and how then shall god be yet conceived of as simple the things therefore about god are spoken of after the manner of men they are so conceived of as befits god and the measure of our tongue will not wrong the nature that is above all and therefore even though the son be found speaking of the will of the father as of something other than he you will make no difference attributing fitly to the weakness of our words their not being able to say anything greater nor to signify their meaning in any other way and let these things be said in proof of the son being conceived of as also the will of the father but in the passage before us no reason will compel us to conceive that the will of the father means the son but rather we may well receive it as his good will to the lost thirty five say not ye there are yet four months and the harvest cometh he again taketh occasions of his discourse from the time and event and from the grosser things of sense he fashioneth his declaration of spiritual ideas for it was yet winter at that time and the tender sprouting and fresh stalk of the seed was scarce bristling forth from the soil but after the expiration of four months it was awaiting its fall into the hands of the reaper do not therefore ye men say saith he that there are yet four months and the harvest cometh behold i say unto you lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest that is raising up the eye of your understanding a little from the affairs of the earth consider ye the spiritual sowing that it hath progressed already and whitened unto the floor and at length calls for the reaper's sickle unto itself but from the similarity to things in actual life you will see what is meant for you will conceive that the spiritual sowing and multitude of spiritual ears are they who tilled beforehand by the voice of the prophets are brought to the faith that should be shown through christ but it is white as being already ripe and ready to the faith and confirmed unto piety but the sickle of the reaper is the glittering and most sharp word of the apostle cutting away the hearers from the worship according to the law transferring them to the floor that is to the church of god there they bruised and pressed by good toils shall be set forth pure wheat worthy of the garner of him who gathereth it thirty six thirty seven and he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together for herein is the saying true one soweth and another reapeth it is the time saith he of the word calling to the faith and showing to the hearers the arrival at its consummation of the legal and prophetic teachings 
for the law by typical services as in shadows did foreshow him that should come that is christ the prophets after it interpreting the words of the spirit yet a little while were for signifying that he was even now at hand and coming but since he hath stepped within the doors the word of the apostles will not remove to far distant hope that which was expected but will reveal it already present and will reap from legal worship those who are yet in bondage to the law and who rest in the letter only and will transfer them as sheaves into the evangelic habit and polity and will likewise cut off from polytheistic straying the worshipper of idols and will transfer him to the knowledge of him that is in truth god and to speak all in brief and succinctly will transform them who mind things on the earth unto the life of the angels through faith to christward this saith he the word of the reapers will effect yet shall it not be without an hire for it shall surely gather for them fruit which nourisheth unto life eternal nor shall they who receive rejoice in themselves alone but as having entered into the labours of the prophets and having reaped the seed foretilled by them shall fill up one company with them but i suppose that the most wise paul having thoroughly learnt the types of things to come hence says of the holy fathers and the prophets that these all perfected through faith received not the promise god having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect for the saviour thought good that the reaper should rejoice together with him who before had sown thirty eight i sent you to reap that whereon ye have not laboured other men have laboured and ye are entered into their labours he at length unveils to them the whole mystery and having removed the dark cloak of words renders most clear the understanding of his meaning for the saviour being a lover of the prophets and a lover of the apostles makes neither the labour of those to be apart from the hand of the apostles nor does he allot entirely to the holy apostles the glorying in respect of those who should be saved through faith in him but having mingled as it were the toil of each with their mutual co-work he says and with great reason that one shall be the honour to both he affirms that the apostles had entered into the labours of the holy prophets not suffering them to spring upon the good fame of those who preceded them but persuading them rather to honour them as having gone before them in labour and time that this will be to us too a most beautiful lesson who will refuse to admit thirty nine and from that city many of the samaritans believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified he told me all that ever i did israel is again hereby too condemned and by the obedience of the samaritans is convicted of being alike reckless of knowing and harsh for the evangelist marvels much at the many who believed on christ saying for the saying of the woman although they who were instructed through the law to the knowledge hereof neither received the words of moses nor acknowledged that they ought to believe the heraldings of the prophets he in these words prepares the way before or rather wisely makes a defence before for that israel should with reason be thrust away from the grace and hope that is to christ's word and that instead should come in the more obedient fullness of the gentiles or aliens forty forty one so when the samaritans were come unto him they besought him that he would tarry with them and he abode there two days and many more believed because of his own word he explains in simplicity of words what took place but prepares again another proof that israel ought justly to be cast off from their hope and the aliens to be transplanted into it for the jews with their bitter and intolerable surmises spitefully entreat jesus manifoldly working miracles and radiant and god-befitting glory 
and blush not to rage to so great an extent as to make him an exile and zealously to drive out of their city him who is the giver to them of all joy while the samaritans persuaded by the words of one woman consider that they ought to come to him with all speed and when they were come they began zealously to entreat him to come into their city and to pour forth to them the word of salvation and readily does christ ascend to both knowing that the grace will not be unfruitful for many believed because of his own word let him that is god-loving and pious hence know that from them that grieve him christ departeth but he dwelleth in them that gladden him through obedience and good faith forty two and said unto the woman no longer do we believe because of thy saying for ourselves have heard him and know that this is indeed the saviour of the world from the greater things does the faith of the samaritans spring and not any longer from what they learn from others but from those whereof they are the wondering ear witnesses for they say that they know that he is indeed the saviour of the world making the confession of their hope in him the pledge of their faith forty three forty four now after the two days he departed thence unto galilee for jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honour in his own country he departs from samaria having now sown the word of salvation and like a husbandman hidden the faith in them that dwell there not that it might be bound captive in the silence of them that received it quiet and deep buried but rather that it might grow in the souls of all creeping on and advancing ever to the greater and running to the more evident might but since he passes by nazareth lying in the midst wherein it is said that he was also brought up so that he seemed to be from thence and its citizen and goes down rather to galilee of necessity he offers an explanation of his passing it by and says that jesus himself had testified that a prophet hath no honour in his own country for it is our nature to think nothing of what we are accustomed to even though it be great and of price and the saviour thought not good to seek honour from them like a vainglorious man and a braggart but knew well that to those who have no thought that one ought to honour one's teacher neither would the word of the faith be any longer sweet and acceptable with reason then does he pass by not thinking it right to expend useless labours upon them who are nothing profited and thus to lay down grace before them that despise it for it was not reasonable that they who sinned so deeply should do so unpunished since it is altogether confessed and undoubted that they will undergo the severest punishments who knowingly despise him and spurn a gift so worthy of marvel forty five when therefore he was come into galilee the galileans received him having seen all the things that he did at jerusalem at the feast for they also went unto the feast not without consideration do the galileans receive jesus but in just astonishment at the wondrous works which they themselves had already seen him do both by their piety towards him condemning the folly of the jews and found far superior in good feeling to those who were instructed in the law forty six he came therefore again into cana of galilee where he made the water wine christ loveth to dwell among those that are well disposed and to those who more readily advance under the perception and knowledge of benefits done them he poureth forth supplies of greater goods he cometh then to work miracles in cana thinking it fit to confer an additional benefit on those therein in that he had through his signs already wrought there the idea previously implanted in their minds that he could do all things forty seven forty eight and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at capernaum when he heard that jesus was come out of judea into galilee he sought him that he would come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death jesus therefore said unto him 
the nobleman cometh as to one able to heal but he understandeth not yet that he is by nature god he calleth him lord but giveth not at all the true dignity of lordship for he would have straightway fallen down and besought him not that he should by all means come to his house and go down with him to the sick lad but should rather with authority and god befitting command drive away the sickness that fell on him for what need for him to be present to the sick whom he could easily heal even absent how was it not utterly without understanding to suppose that he is superior to death and in no wise to hold him god who is filled with god befitting power forty nine except ye see signs and wonders ye will not believe the nobleman saith unto him a mind yet hard dwelleth in them who are deceived but might here will be the more wonder-working power of him that calleth them unto faith wherefore the saviour says that they need wonders that they may easily be reinstructed unto what is profitable and acknowledge him who is by nature god lord come down ere my child die feeble indeed unto understanding is the nobleman for he is a child in his petition for grace and almost dotes without perceiving it for by believing that christ had power not only when present but that he would surely avail even absent he would have had a most worthy conception of him but now both thinking and acting most foolishly he asked power befitting god and does not think he accomplishes all things as god nor yet that he will be superior to death although beseeching him to gain the advantage over him that had all but overcome for the child was at the point of death fifty jesus saith unto him go thy way thy son liveth thus believing he ought to have come but christ doth not reject our lack of apprehension but benefiteth even the stumbling as god that when which the man should have been admired for doing this does he teach him even when he doth it not revealed alike as the teacher of things most lovely and the giver of good things in prayer for in go thy way is faith in thy son liveth is the fulfilment of his longings granted with plenteous and god befitting authority fifty one the man believed the word that jesus said to him and went his way and as he was now going down his servants met him and told him saying thy son liveth the one command of the saviour healeth two souls for in the nobleman it worketh unwonted faith the child it rescueth from bodily death which is healed first it is hard to say both i suppose simultaneously the disease taking its departure at the command of the saviour and his servants meeting him tell him of the healing of the child showing at the same time the swiftness of the divine commands christ ordering this very wisely and by the fulfilment of his hope speedily confirming their master weak in faith fifty two fifty three fifty four he therefore inquired of them the hour when he began to amend and they said unto him yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him so the father knew that it was at the same hour in which jesus said unto him thy son liveth and himself believed and his whole house this is again the second miracle that jesus did when he was come out of judea unto galilee he inquires of them the hour of the turn for the better of the sick child to prove whether it coincides with the time of the grace when he had learned that thus it was and no otherwise he is saved with his whole house attributing the power of the miracle to the saviour christ and bringing to him a firmer faith as a fruit of thank offering for these things end of chapter five part two
Chapter Five, Part Three of Commentary on the Gospel of John, Book Two, by Cyril of Alexandria, translated by Reverend Philip Edward Pusey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five, Two, Three, Four. After this was the feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem the pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel of the Lord used to go down at a certain season into the pool, and troubled the water. Whosoever therefore first after the troubling of the water stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Not for nothing does the blessed evangelist straightway connect with what has been said, the Saviour's return thence to Jerusalem. But his aim probably was to show how superior in obedience were the aliens to the Jews, how great a difference of habit and manners is seen between them. For thus, and in no other way, could we learn that by the just judgment of god who ruleth all and knoweth not to accept the person of man israel with reason falleth from the hope and the fulness of the gentiles is brought in in his place it is not hard by looking at the contrast of the chapters to test what has been said he showed therefore that he had by one miracle saved the city of the samaritans by one likewise the nobleman and by it had profited full surely, I ween, and exceeding much those who were therein. Having by these things testified the extreme readiness of the aliens to obedience, he brings the miracle worker back to Jerusalem, and shows him accomplishing a God-befitting act. For he wondrously frees the paralytic from a most inveterate disease, even as he had the nobleman's son just dying but the one believed with his whole house and confessed that jesus is god while the others who ought to have been astonished straightway desired to kill and persecute as though blasphemously transgressing their benefactor themselves against themselves pronouncing more shameful condemnation in that they are found to fall short of the understanding of the aliens and their piety towards christ and this it was which was spoken of them in the psalms as to our lord jesus thou shalt make them the back for they having been set in the first rank because of the election of the fathers will come last and after the calling of the gentiles for when the fullness of the gentiles is come in then shall all israel be saved this line of thought the well-arranged order of the compilation of chapters brings forth to us but we will make accurate inquiry part by part of the meaning of single verses five six and a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years when jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time the Jews, having celebrated their feast of unleavened bread, in which it is their custom to kill the sheep, to wit, at the same time of the Passover, Christ departeth from Jerusalem, and mingleth with the Samaritans and aliens, and teacheth among them, being grieved at the stubbornness of the Jews. And having barely returned at the holy Pentecost, for this was the next solemnity in Jerusalem, and at no great interval, he heals at the waters of the pool the paralytic who had passed long time in sickness for it was even his thirty-eighth year but who had not yet attained unto the perfect number of the law i speak of four times ten or forty here then will end the course of the history but we must transform again the typical letter unto its spiritual interpretation that jesus grieved departs from jerusalem after the killing of the sheep goes to the samaritans and galileans and preaches among them the word of salvation what else will this mean save his actual withdrawal from the jews 
after his sacrifice and death at jerusalem upon the precious cross when he at length began to freely give himself to them of the gentiles and aliens bidding it to be shown to his disciples after his resurrection that he goeth before them all into galilee but his return again at the fulfilment of the weeks of holy pentecost to jerusalem signifies as it were in types and darkly that there will be of his loving-kindness a return of our saviour to the jews in the last ages of the present world wherein they who have been saved through faith in him shall celebrate the all-holy feast of the saving passion but that the paralytic is healed before the full time of the law signifies again by a corresponding type that israel having blasphemously raged against christ will be infirm and paralytic and will spend a long time in doing nothing yet will not depart to complete punishment but will have some visitation from the saviour and will himself too be healed at the pool by obedience and faith but that the number forty is perfect according to the divine law will be by no means hard to learn by them who have once read the divine scriptures seven jesus saith unto him wilt thou be made whole the impotent man answered him an evident proof of the extreme goodness of christ that he doth not wait for entreaties from the sick but forecometh their request by his loving-kindness for he runneth as you see to him as he lieth and compassionateth him that was sick without comfort but the inquiry whether he would like to be relieved from his infirmity was not that of one asking out of ignorance a thing manifest and evident to all but of one stirring up to more earnest desire and inciting to most diligent entreaty the question whether he will to obtain what he longed for is big with a kind of force and expression that he has the power to give and is even now ready thereto and only waits for the request of him who receiveth the grace eight sir i have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool but while i am coming another steppeth down before me jesus saith unto him rise about the day of the holy pentecost angels coming down from heaven used to trouble the water of the pool then they would make the plash therefrom the herald of their presence and the water would be sanctified by the holy spirits and whoever was beforehand of the multitude of sick people and getting down he would come up again disburdened of the suffering that troubled him yet to one alone him who first seized it was the might of healing meted out but this too was a sign of the benefit of the law by the hands of the angels which extended to the one race of the jews alone and healed none other save they for from dan so called even unto beersheba the commandments given by moses were spoken ministered by angels in mount sinai in the days afterwards marked out as the holy pentecost for this reason the water too of the pool used not to be troubled at any other time signifying therethrough the descent of the holy angels thereon the paralytic then not having any one to thrust him into the water with the disease that holds him was bewailing the want of healers saying i have no man to wit to let him down into the water for he fully expected that jesus would tell and advise him this nine take up thy bed and walk and immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked and on the same day was the sabbath god befitting the injunction and possessing clearest evidence of power and authority above man for he prays not for the loosing of his sickness for the patient lest he too should seem to be as one of the holy prophets but as the lord of powers he commandeth with authority that it be so telling him to go home rejoicing to take his bed on his shoulders to be a memento to the beholders of the might of him that had healed him 
forthwith the sick man does as is bidden him and by obedience and faith he gaineth to himself the thrice longed-for grace but since in the foregoing we introduced him as the image and type of the multitude of the jews who should be healed in the last times come let us think of something again harmonizing with the thoughts hereto pertaining analogous to those before examined on the sabbath day doth christ heal the man when healed he immediately enjoins him to break through the custom of the law inducing him to walk on the sabbath and this laden with his bed although god clearly cries aloud by one of the holy prophets neither carry forth a burthen out of your house on the sabbath day and no one i suppose who is sober-minded would say that the man was rendered a despiser or unruly to the divine commands but that as in a type christ was making known to the jews that they should be healed by obedience and faith in the last times of the world for this i think the sabbath signifies being the last day of the week but that having once received the healing through faith and having been remodelled unto newness of life it was necessary that the oldness of the letter of the law should become of no effect and that the typical worship as it were in shadows and the vain observance of jewish custom should be rejected hence i think the blessed paul too taking occasion of speech writes to them who after the faith were returning again to the law i say unto you that if ye be circumcised christ shall profit you nothing and again ye are severed from christ whosoever of you are justified by the law ye are fallen from grace ten the jews therefore said unto him that was cured it is the sabbath day it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed most seasonably i think doth he cry over them hear now this o foolish people and heartless which have eyes and see not for what can be more uninstructed than such people or what greater in senselessness for they do not even admit into their mind that they ought to wonder at the power of the healer but being bitter reprovers and skilled in this alone they lay the charge of breaking the law about him who had just and with difficulty recovered from a long disease and foolishly bid him lie down again as though the honour due to the sabbath were paid by having to be ill eleven twelve he answered them he that made me whole he said unto me take up thy bed and walk they asked him therefore the sentence is replete with wisest meaning and repulsive of the stubbornness of the jews for in that they say that it is not lawful on the sabbath day to take up his bed and go home devising an accusation of breaking the law against him that was healed needs does he bring against them a more resolved defence saying that he had been ordered to walk by him who was manifested to him as the giver of health all but saying something of this sort most worthy of honour sirs do i say that he is even though he bid me violate the honour of the sabbath who hath so great power and grace as to drive away my disease for if excellence in these things belongeth not to every chance man but will befit rather god befitting power and might how saith he shall the worker of these things do wrong or how shall not he who is possessed of god befitting power surely counsel what is well pleasing to god the speech then has within itself some pungent meaning thirteen fourteen what man is he which said unto thee take up thy bed and walk but he that was healed wist not who it was for jesus had conveyed himself away a multitude being in the place afterward jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him insatiable unto bloodshed is the mind of the jews for they search out who it was who had commanded this with design to involve him together with the miraculously healed 
for he alone it seems was like to be vexing them in respect of the sabbath who had but now escaped impassable toils and snares and had been drawn away from the very gates of death but he could not tell his physician although they make diligent inquiries christ having well and economically concealed himself that he might escape the present heat of their anger and not as though he could suffer anything of necessity unless he willed to suffer doth he practise flight but making himself an example to us in this also behold thou art made whole sin no more lest a worse thing come to thee being hid at first economically he appears again economically observing the time fit for each for it was not possible that aught should be done by him who knew no sin which should not really have its fit reason the reason then of his speaking to him he made a message for his soul's health saying that it behoved him to transgress no more lest he be tormented by worse evils than those past herein he teaches that not only does god treasure up man's transgressions unto the judgment to come but manifoldly scourgeth those yet living in their bodies even before the great and notable day of him that shall judge all but that we are oftentimes smitten when we stumble and grieve god the most wise paul will testify crying for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep for if we would judge ourselves we should not be judged but when we are judged we are chastened of the lord that we be not condemned with the world fifteen the man departed and told the jews that it was jesus which had made him whole he makes jesus known to the jews not that they by daring to do anything against him should be found to be blasphemers but in order that if they too should be willing to be healed by him they might know the wondrous physician for observe how this was his aim for he does not come like one of the fault-finders and say that it was jesus who had bidden him walk on the sabbath day but which had made him whole but this was the part of one doing naught save only making known his physician sixteen seventeen and therefore did the jews persecute jesus and sought to slay him because he was doing these things on the sabbath day but jesus answered them the narrative does not herein contain the simple relation of the madness of the jews for the evangelist does not show only that they persecute him but why they blush not to do this saying most emphatically because he was doing these things on the sabbath day for they persecute him foolishly and blasphemously as though the law forbade to do good on the sabbath day as though it were not lawful to pity and compassionate the sick as though it behoved to put off the law of love the praise of brotherly kindness the grace of gentleness and what if good things may one not show that the jews did in manifold ways spurn not knowing the aim of the lawgiver respecting the sabbath and making the observance of it most empty for as christ himself somewhere said each one of them taketh his ox or his sheep and leadeth them away to watering and that a man on the sabbath day receiveth circumcision that the law of moses be not broken and then they are angry because he made a man every whit whole on the sabbath day by reason of the exceeding stubbornness alike and undisciplinedness of their habits not even to brutes preferring him that is made in the divine image but thinking that one ought to pity a sheep on the sabbath day and unblamed to free it from famine and thirst yet that they are open to the charge of transgressing the law to the last degree who are gentle and good to their neighbour on the sabbath but that we may see that they were beyond measure senseless and therefore with justice deserve to hear ye do err not knowing the scriptures come let us taking somewhat from the divine scriptures too show clearly that jesus was long ago foredepicted as any type taking no account of the sabbath the all-wise moses then having at a great age as it is written 
departed from things of men and been removed to the mansions above by the judgment and decree of god that ruleth all joshua the son of nun obtained and inherited the command over israel when he therefore having set in array heavy armed soldiers ten thousand strong round about jericho was devising to take at length and overthrow it he arranged with the levites to take the ark round about for six whole days but on the seventh day that is the sabbath he commanded the innumerable multitude of the host to shout along with the trumpets and thus the wall was thrown down and they rushing in took the city not observing the unseasonable rest of the sabbath nor refusing their victory thereon by reason of the law restraining them nor yet did they then withstand the generalship of joshua but wholly free from reproach did they keep the command of the man and herein is the type but when the truth came that is christ who destroyed and overcame the corruption set up against man's nature by the devil and is seen doing this on the sabbath as in preface and commencement of action in the case of the paralytic they foolishly take it ill and condemn the obedience of their fathers not suffering nature to conquer on the sabbath day the despite done it by sickness to such extent as to be zealous in persecuting jesus who was working good on the sabbath day my father worketh hitherto and i work christ is speaking as it were on the sabbath day for this the word hitherto must necessarily signify that the force of the idea may receive its own fitting meaning but the jews who were untutored and knew not who the only begotten is by nature but attributed to god the father alone the appointing of the law through moses and asserted that we ought to obey him alone these he attempts to clearly convince that he works all things together with the father and that having the nature of him who begat him in himself by reason of his not being other than he as far as pertains to sameness of essence he will never think aught else than as seemeth good to him who begat him but as being of the same essence he will also will the same things yea rather being himself the living will and power of the father he worketh all things in all with the father in order then that he might repel the vain murmuring of the jews and might shame them who were persecuting him on those grounds whereon they thought good to be angry as though the honour due to the sabbath were despised he says my father worketh hitherto and i work for he all but wishes to signify some such thing as this if thou believest o man that god having created and compacted all things by his command and will ordereth the creation on the sabbath day also so that the sun riseth rain-giving fountains are let loose and fruits spring from the earth not refusing their increase by reason of the sabbath the fire works its own work ministering to the necessities of man unforbidden confess and know of a surety that the father worketh god befitting operations on the sabbath also why then saith he dost thou uninstructedly accuse him through whom he works all things for god the father will work in no other way save through his power and wisdom the son therefore says he and i work he shames then with arguments ad absurdum the unbridled mind of his persecutors showing that they do not so much oppose himself as speak against the father to whom alone they were zealous to ascribe the honour of the law not yet knowing the son who is of him and through him by nature for this reason does he call god specially his own father leading them most skilfully to this most excellent and precious lesson 18. For this, therefore, did the Jews seek the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but saying also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. The mind of the Jews is wound up unto cruelty, and whereby they ought to have been healed, they are the more sick, 
that they may justly hear how say ye we are wise for when they ought to have been softened in disposition transformed by suitable reasoning unto piety they even devise slaughter against him who proves by his deeds that he hath in no whit transgressed the divine law by healing a man on the sabbath they weave in with their wrath on account of the sabbath the truth as a charge of blasphemy snaring themselves in the meshes of their own transgressions unto wrath indissoluble for they seem to be pious in their distress that he being a man should say that god was his father for they knew not yet that he who was for our sakes made in the form of a servant is god the word the life gushing forth from god the father that is the only begotten to whom alone god is rightly and truly inscribed and is father but to us by no means so for we are adopted mounting up to excellency above nature through the will of him that honoured us and gaining the title of gods and sons because of christ that dwelleth in us through the holy ghost looking therefore to the flesh alone and not acknowledging god who dwelleth in the flesh they endure not his springing up to measure beyond the nature of man through his saying that god was his father for in saying my father he would with reason introduce this idea but they deem that he whose father god properly is must be by nature equal with him in this alone conceiving rightly for so it is and no otherwise since then the word introduces with it this meaning they perverting the upright word of truth are more angry End of chapter five